They say if you are able to combine your passion with your gifts and your values, you have found your purpose. My next guest falls directly into that category. A gifted wildlife photographer, her photos have received many national and international awards and appeared in prestigious media outlets such as National Geographic and the BBC, which featured her photos of the Mola Mola sunfish. But she is best known for her remarkable underwater photos of whales from places as exotic as Tonga and as familiar as the Monterey Bay. Tonight, you'll hear about her amazing journey, leading safaris in Africa, photo shoots in Antarctica, her contributions to science, a close encounter with a baby whale, and the controversial image of cats and dogs that put her in the national spotlight. I'm Becca Reed, and we'll be right back with Jody Frediani. Welcome, Jody Frediani. Thank you. Pleasure oh, to be here. Oh, well, you're, uh, we're so happy that you have taken the time to share your thoughts with us today and uh, to share um, all about uh, your work traveling the world, shooting all kinds of animals, and, um, and then focusing on whales. Just um, wonderful. And speaking of, of your whale photos, I would really like to start this interview by showing the audience what kind of um, work that you do, and then we'll get back to how, how you got to do it. The first uh, photo I'd like to show is of whales um, making bubbles. Can you talk about how you got this amazing photo? Sure. Um, and, I, and I find it interesting that you have decided to start with that photo because right now I'm working with a colleague on several papers on bubble use by humpback whales. So it's a very dear subject to me. And um, I, I swim with humpback whales on the Silver Bank, which is off the Dominican Republic, and I've been doing that for um, 20 years now. And the males use bubbles in, um, in competitive groups where they're competing to escort a female. And usually what we see at the surface is a whale, uh, what's called the primary escort will come to the top, come to the surface and blow this great big bubble blast. So this is a great big bubble trail. But sometimes they're blowing what bubbles beneath the surface. And if we're in a boat, we don't necessarily see that. So um, I have been able to get in the water and sometimes the whale swims by. But in this case, um, we knew that this whale was swimming past us and we couldn't get in the water at that moment in time. It wasn't appropriate. So I just took my camera on the housing and I, we're in a small boat. I just leaned over the side, stuck my camera in there and started shooting. And so it, it's a little bit like um, a, a, a trail cam where you set it up where you expect the animal to be and, and it takes photos every time it moves. In this case, I knew the animals was passing by. I had no idea what it was doing, what direction it was going in, but I stuck my camera in the right way um, and, and just clicked the shutter and, and got that image. So amazing. Were you, when you got home, or, or can you look at it there? Could you look oh, yeah. out and see oh, yeah. if you got it? <laughs> I can't wait that long. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> one of the blessings. One of the blessings with digital photography is you don't have to wait until you get home and you send the <laughs> film in and it comes back and you find out all the mistakes you made. You have to get to find that out right away and you get the, uh, the satisfaction of knowing when you've actually captured something. Um, oh. and, that, and that is pretty unique. Scientists don't really know exactly all the things that whales are doing when they, they are blowing those bubbles. No, I mean, it, it's in fact, um, there are papers that have been done on um, as I mentioned, the competitive behavior where these whales grow, blow great big bubbles at the surface. And it's thought to be um, a way of screening the female from the other males who are in the group and showing how powerful they are. And then there uh, is kind of a bit of work that's been done on humpback whales using bubbles um, in what's called cooperative bubble net feeding up in Alaska, where they blow these these carousels of bubbles and capture the herring inside of them. 
but the rest of it, there's, there's not really anything out there. So I'm working with a colleague and we are preparing, beginning to work on several papers to deal with that. So it's exciting. That is exciting. And I, I think that it is really, um, it's really wonderful how you've been able to keep your love of art and of animals and of conservation all, all going at one time. And we'll get back to the science work that you do with photography. And, uh, but first I'm, I would very like, I would like to know how you managed to combine all this. Was it, it seems like you're doing all the things you love and you've created more than a career, you've created a life. And how did, would you, was this your plan or did this evolve? Um, so it's, it's a long story <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and my life has evolved um, through, I've, I've worn many hats, let's put it this way. I've had uh, done many different things in my lifetime, but when I was in high school at that moment where you're deciding what to do and what to study um, when you go off to college, I wanted to study biology um, and I wanted to study art. And I considered going to the Sorbonne and I considered going to Scripps University to study marine biology. And um, I, I went a slightly different path, but I was very interested at that time in studying um, art and science and particularly fascinated with animals and animal behavior. I mean, we always had, I didn't have any brothers and sisters. So my siblings were the dogs, the cats, the parakeets, the lizards, you know, all the rest of the animals that we had. My parents both loved, loved animals, so we had a lot of pets and went to the zoo. And um, I, I then detoured. I went away and I, and I studied photography in high school, but I didn't really stick with it until, um, until I was an adult and took some classes at Cabrillo College and found that I really loved, the, loved photography and initially used it to photo for, for advertising purposes, because my, um, my husband at the time and I raised dairy goats and we sold them nationally and internationally. And so I would photograph the goats and, you know, this is the perfect goat and we'd sell them. And it wasn't until I basically retired from my various and sundry work um, things that I began to really get into my photography and um, combine, come back around and combine the science and the art and my passion for animals. Now, one of the one of the projects that you did, I believe you did in graduate school, did did hinge on your passion for animals. It was about the other homeless, homeless cats and dogs. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you accepted that assignment? And I think that must have been hard to do. Talk about that assignment. It was definitely hard. Um, at that point in time, um, and I should say that when I uh, I, I said my life has, has gone through many, many different directions. I started out as a biology major and I went off to um, the university and, um, and then, then took a break, got married, had kids, had goats, did other things. <laughs> and then when I got divorced, I went back to school and I studied art and photography. And that project that you reference, I was um, doing a graduate program at UC Santa Cruz and my professor said, my advisor said, this request came in to do this project at the SPCA. And if you don't wanna do it, I will do it, but I think it's your project. And it was to track two animals, two dogs through the, the whole process, the intake process, um, you know, what happened to the animals, the adoption of one and the euthanasia of another. And um, I said, okay, because not only was it about animals and I had been involved, it's one of my hats, um, training, training animals, training dogs and cats for many years and training people to deal with their animals' behavioral issues. And so we'd done a lot of work uh, at animal shelters, but I had also always been fascinated about what I call um, real, real life processes that are hidden. So, um, if I traveled in Europe and we went to a meat market and here we buy meat, it's in a plastic, it's plastic wrapped, you know, and, and it's cuts. We don't see the head, we don't see the feet, but in Europe, it's all there. I mean, the carcasses are hanging, the heads are in the, in the cases, the chicken's feet are there. And I was always fascinated by that. And 
I was also an organic farmer and we raised livestock here and we had a, a custom butcher come out and he would butcher hogs and I would photograph that. So cool. it, it made, yes, but this made perfect sense to me to do this SP, SPCA project. And yet I remember one day, and it was a small, small group of students in this program. Um, one of the other, other students said to me, you're not taking enough images, you're not shooting enough. And I said, at that time, I think I'd lived in Santa Cruz for maybe 20 years. And I said, I'm getting lost going to the SPCA. That's how difficult it is for me. It's having that impact on me. And one day, um, one of the shelter workers had said to me, you choose which animal we're gonna euthanize today. Yeah, exactly. And I said, I'm afraid that's not in my job description. <laughs> I'll photograph, <laughs> you, you make that choice. So it, it, was, it was quite challenging um, and it was a satisfying project. The director of the SPCA at the time wanted to, she wanted to end euthanasia basically. And shelters would always put out cute photos of kittens and puppies in their fundraising appeals. And she wanted something else that showed what the shelter workers had to deal with. And, um, and it, it became a project entitled Our Other Homeless. Um, it was exhibited at the, it's at the Art Center. I, I, thought, I don't remember what it's called anymore. In Santa Cruz, it was featured in the, um, the Sentinel and the San Jose Mercury. And at least one of my images ended up on a billboard in Los Angeles that caused quite a to-do. Um, and then was covered on KGO in San Francisco, like, and people said, "Get a life! How dare you, you know, expose us to this?" And what, what was fast photo? Um, I believe it was it was the barrel room at the shelter, where um, it's even difficult to talk about it. Animals, you know, dogs and cats would be euthanized because there were too many of them. There were no homes for them. And after a certain length of time, um, they, they would go through that process and then they would be put in barrels in uh, a walk-in freezer, uh, not a walk-in cooler, you know, refrigerator. And once a week, the tallow company would have a truck come and all these barrels would get dumped into the back of this truck and they would go to San Jose and they would get processed into tallow and whatever else. Um, there might be deer, roadkill deer and others in there as well. And I was given access. So I photographed in the barrel room. I climbed a ladder when the truck was there, photographed down into the truck. And I believe the photo, and it was a, it was a nonprofit that had, had um, purchased the billboard space and ran this image again, because at that time it was a real big push to end this overpopulation of pets and this crazy thing that we do of absolutely loving and adoring these animals and yet allowing them to breed or breeding them and, and then having them killed en masse, you know, thousands a year, so. That is a, um, a, 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 a sort of a minor theme I notice in your work is some of it is very beautiful and others are very painful. You have really beautiful photos of animals in Africa, and you also have photos of elephants having their having prosthetic legs attached, which is great that they can get legs, but it makes you feel badly that they've lost their legs or their feet have been injured. What is that? It's like two. It's like two sides of you. It's like you have a journalistic side and an, and a beauty side. How how are you? How does it feel to merge those two? Well, I say schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, to me, it, it's really, both sides are really important. And one of the things that I've, I've learned along the way is um, people get overwhelmed by the difficult, and particularly when it comes to pets. I mean, it's amazing how much um, human suffering we have become inured to and can, can look at, but when it comes to animals or pets, people have a very, very difficult time. 
um, with that. And, and I think that's as it should be, unfortunately, it should be the same with humans. And so you can't just, um, you can't just sort of bludgeon people, you know, and say, this has got to change because they, it's like emotionally, we just block out. And I think to really get people to care about all animals on the planet is they need to see the beauty at the same time. And the, the story of the prosthesis is actually a very positive story um, or a positive outcome of a very difficult story. And that's a case of landmines in, in Thailand and Laos um, where people are trying to hurt people. And then the elephants are um, the collateral damage because they're out there and they, um, you know, in some cases, it's, it's the calf of a mother who is working, you know, hauling logs and the calf is out grazing and steps on a landmine and, and loses, loses its limb. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what I, I love about your photos is they tell a story, each one. I love the photo in Africa of the mom lion and the baby lion. <laughs> <laughs> She's just resting her head. I'm just exhausted. I'm using you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm afraid that was one of those um, photos that um, we had gone out on a in, in Zambia on a, a night safari, which is a common thing to do because you get to see different things at night. And we came across this pride of lions, just several lionesses and other cubs, and they were sound asleep. And the next thing is, you know, this bright light is on them. And I would probably turn the engines off. I don't remember. And the cubs are going, oh, look, mom. Oh, look. And that mother's going, no, this is time for sleeping. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, it, it does tell the story. I'm afraid it tells the story of the people waking the lions up. Yes, about yeah. the story of a tired lion. What is um, Can you, since now that we're or on the lions, we're back to Africa. So what? Um, what took you to Africa? You had you had studied photography, and then Africa. How did that happen? That's that's a good question. So when I was a child, um, you know, all American children are given teddy bears, right? That's a, the ubiquitous, you know, little cuddly animal. Um, I did not have a teddy bear. I had um, actually, you can see her on the couch and the. And, in the back really in the back to my right shoulder yes there's a you can see a whale on a pillow and then in, in this side of that is a little red something i see the I, little I, red something. I was i was given a, a knit elephant and oh. her name was ellie and i used to sleep with her and she's here today with me and i developed very young this wonderful love of africa i also had a, a children's book that had a a propaganda story in it and that, that story was about a little boy who wouldn't let his mother wash behind his ears. And so he went to bed with dirty ears. In the middle of the night, the calico dog on the foot of his bed gets up, flaps his ears, and the little boy wakes up and says, where are you going? And he says, I'm flying around the world. And the little boy says, please, please, can I come with you? It's like, OK. He climbs on the back of the calico dog, and they fly off to Africa. And there they are. And he looks down, and he sees a mother elephant with her baby in the river and she's washing the baby and he says let's go down and he says please can i play with your baby and she says oh no your ears are too dirty and the same thing happens when he sees a hippo no no your ears are too dirty so in the morning he he lets his mother wash behind his ears but those those images of these wild animals when i was quite young um, and the first time I went, and then I had the opportunity to teach the animal training work I was doing um, in in Southern Africa, um, different countries, and uh, was invited over to teach at at uh, safari safari lodges and things. And then I began to had the opportunity to take people over on small safaris and um, photographed while I was doing all of that. So, how do you get how how do you get the job of animal safari leader? Where is the what did you know? <laughs> what were your credentials for that? Uh, yes. So I would call the credential is following your dreams, you know, and following your heart. 
And I had desperately wanted to go to Botswana and met a woman whose sister lived there um, and had a difficult horse. And at that point I was, I was training horses and working with problems. And I said, I I'll come. And I came and it was Christmas time, which of course in Botswana is not the best time to go because it can be incredibly hot. And the woman had to go off to Johannesburg to um, have Christmas with her father. I couldn't stay at her house. I was staying at a really dusty campgrounds. And I gave a demo of this coursework that I was doing. And I said, is there anybody here who'd be willing to put me up? And a woman said, yes, you can stay with us. And she helped me take care of, uh, help, help work with that woman's horse. And then not long after that, she and her husband moved to Namibia. And he was a pilot, a bush pilot who worked for wilderness safaris. And she worked in the office part-time. And they, they said, look, um, can we get you back over here? This was like later on to teach a safari, uh, uh, teach um, classes on this with work was called T-Touch or Tellington Touch. And we can't, people can't afford to pay very much. They'd pay like $20 for a class. And that's great, but it didn't pay my airfare to get there. And she said, but we'll put you on a, on a fly in safari in between. So you teach this weekend, then you go fly five days to safari camps and then you teach again. And I said, I'm in. And, um, and then they gave me tour operator rates. So I was able to bring people back. Um, they would organize the safaris, the different camps um, and away we, away we went. Yeah. What a wonderful thing to have unfold for you. It, yes, I was really fortunate. That was that well, man. How long did you? So you have been to many countries in Africa. How long did you stay? Well, I mean, I went, then I came back, and I went, and I came back. <laughs> I mean, it was it was um, you know usually relatively you know one two weeks, maybe three weeks or something like that. I, I did some Earth Watch projects over there, um, and I I I did a fairly extended tour. You know, maybe a month. I'm not sure through Zimbabwe and Southern Africa, South Africa, um, teaching, teaching these workshops, uh, went back to Swaziland and taught um, some clinics there, um, taught in Namibia. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I learned some skills and uh, people over there wanted somebody to go teach. And at that time there was nobody else. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm your person. So. So you brought your camera with you, apparently. Yes. And did you start taking wildlife? <laughs> was that your first wildlife photography? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I had been using my camera by then. That was back in the 90s. And in the 80s uh, was when I had started to go uh, take some courses at Cabrillo College because I'd gone to Yosemite with my, my husband and kids and took some what I was impressed with photos and thought, gee, Maybe if I learned something, I can do even better and, um, and began to study and, and uh, really, really understood, you know, that was in the film days and, and how to take an image out of the camera and actually turn it into um, something of beauty and something that told a story. Um, but I, I'm not sure. Um, I think Africa was probably the beginning of my, my, wildlife, um, my wildlife photos. Fabulous. Well, that was a great place to start. That you have one really beautiful photo that I hope we can show. It's a plane and there are zebras and elephants on the plane and possibly other animals. And in the distance, it's kind of blue. And in the distance is like a twister, like a really skinny, I think it's an award-winning photo. Was, do you it remember? Is. How did you yes. to be there <laughs> at that perfect <laughs> moment? Um, that was, that's, um, in Atosha National Park in Namibia. And the location in the park is called the Atosha Pan, which is a, a large, I guess an ancient lake, but it's um, white clay, uh, very dusty. And, you know, I mentioned that I had the opportunity to take people on safari, but that wasn't enough. So I would, sometimes I would go and visit my friends and um, rent a vehicle and, take somebody with me who could be my navigator and because we're driving on the other side of the road. And I would go to, um, you know, I might go to Atasha, I might go to a few camps on my own, just, just drive. And um, 
I don't remember exactly which trip that was, but you know, I, 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 I took workshops. I also took some workshops in Santa Fe on um, you know, photography. And I remember seeing some beautiful work there and realizing that it's a combination of having the equipment, having the preparation, which may be learning about your subject, learning how to use your equipment, having the opportunity to go to the location, and then having the universe come and cooperate with you. And that's what happened for that particular image. Did you have to wait a long time to get that moment? Did you sit there for a long while waiting for the perfect thing? I have no recollection. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long time ago. <laughs> I have, I um, spoke with another photographer once and he said that something like what you've just said. And so he always had a camera with him. He had one in his car, always under the front seat. And he had one in his pocket, you know, a small one. And he got amazing pictures because something happened just then he was there. Is, yes. Does that happen for you that way? Um, or do it, you stalk the animals? I, <laughs> both. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't use stock as in um, search. You know, harass. <laughs> yes, but it, it. Let's put it this way: I, um, I haven't been doing it lately. But then, I the last couple of years, I, um, I had injured my shoulder, and so um, that impacted my ability to take photos. It impacted my ability to do everything. And then I had surgery. Um, but prior to that, I always had my camera in the car with me, and. Um, sometimes something was happening you know it's like i might be on west cliff drive or going home and all of a sudden there's something happening out there or there's um i would hear that there was a dead whale in the kelp and i would go over and there was a couple there and they were had red jackets that said tow boat on the back and i started to talk to them and they were going to um tow they they had been asked to tow this carcass offshore and that has led to a number of other incident situations with the same couple. Um, to, they towed a gray whale <coughs> this, um, this year. And, um, and so that, you know, if I didn't have my camera with me, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have started that whole conversation. But it it's really helps to also know the, know the behavior of the species that you want to photograph. And know the season. So if you want to photograph sandhill cranes, they're going to be in the Central Valley in the fall, you know. So if you go there in June, you're not going to find them. So it, it's a combination of things. So you have sort of a plan, but you're always prepared. Yes. Like Thomas Jefferson, the more I'm prepared, the luckier I get. <laughs> you're, 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 you're almost always prepared. There are certainly times I have not been prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Have you missed us missed something because of that? Have you missed the one that got away? Um, I, I can think of two situations, and I'm not sure I would have gotten decent photos. But one um, was very clear. I was going to town in the evening to an event at the um, Museum of Art and History. It was a, and it was like an oceans um, exhibition. It was the opening, and I remember as I got into my vehicle, I thought. I don't need my, my camera with me. It's nighttime. Never do that. So I went, I went to the, the opening, I enjoyed myself, and I come home and I'm driving up a private road in the dark, there's no lights anywhere. And I look in my headlights and there are two juvenile mountain lions. And I'm going, camera, no camera. <laughs> and, and, and so I just stopped. I turned my engine off. I left my headlights on. And they looked at me and went, oh, no, what do we do? What do we do? And one ran across the road that way. And the other said, uh, uh, I don't know, Ma, and, and turned around and went back. And so I just sat there and I thought, well, that's not going to last forever because they've now gone separate ways. And as I waited, I could see um, the eye shine of the cat that had gone back where it had come from. And then below it, I could see another set of eyes. And I went, oh, that's interesting. And then I went my phone. And at that time, because we don't have cell coverage out here, um, my phone wasn't even on. So I turned it on. And when the screen came on, it lit up my face. 
And at that moment, they could tell what I was and where I was. The juvenile ran across and then mom got up and just kind of looked at me like, okay, and trundled across the road. And I got a photograph with my camera, with my phone, that looks like a raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that image is up here. Always. Well, I, I, oh, I would like to get you a ch uh, chance to redeem yourself with the picture <laughs> <laughs> that you got at the, um, at the Año Nuevo of the baby elephant seal. Can you talk about that? It's just the, the baby that was being born. Uh huh. That, you know, I guess somebody, somebody made a comment recently on some of the images I'd posted on faith, Facebook and, and, you know, said what a great job I had done. And I don't remember what the images were. And I said, and lucky. And sometimes, you know, you just get incredibly lucky. And again, there's a bit of good fortune. It's just maybe a little different than luck. Um, I have a, a cousin um, who is a docent at Ana Nuevo and they have a, um, I guess it's a fundraiser for the Friends of Ana Nuevo or something like that every January. And she has invited me to come and you get to go out and instead of going from place to place with the docent, you, you get to stay at one of the viewing stations. And um, I done that a few times and I got to stay at this viewing station and she had to leave. I feel so bad for her. And the next thing I realized people are looking over here and there's this, this female elephant seal who's giving birth right in front of us facing in the correct direction so we can actually see the birth of her, um, her baby. That's so perfect. yeah, it was, it was pretty special. It was very special. It isn't, it, that doesn't happen. I mean, they obviously, they have babies. So that's a regular deal, but usually not where people see it. Well, yes and no. I mean, if you've been, anybody who's been to Ana Nuevo um, during the elephant seal season, the beaches are just plastered with these great big bodies. And, you know, moms are pupping all over the place. And, but, you know, there might be, 300 yards or 500 yards that way, or they might be in a crush of, um, you know, crush of seals. And um, it's, I don't know how often it happens that the mother is placed in front of the viewing station with no, nothing else obstructing the view. So that is yeah. amazing. I went there for a shoot once and they are, there are so many of them and they're all sandy. And when, at first, as we walked toward them, I was thinking, well, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they kind of blend into, they're so big, you think they're a dune. And they, <laughs> it's the best out there. That, that, that's why they have, that's why they have guides with you. So you don't yeah, got, yeah, I had two rangers with me and they had to weigh an elephant seal. And I was there for that. And that was crazy. I mean, they are not amenable. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I, um, Let's talk about marine life now, since we're on the elephant seal trail. I, I read that you had been um, shooting whales in, in Tonga and got to swim with, or maybe, I don't know if you got to, but it happened that you were swimming with a uh, competitive group of whales and it was uh, sort of dangerous. Can you describe, I've seen that in movies, but can you describe what that means and what the, what's happening and how you got so close? Okay, so I have been swimming, as I said earlier, um, with the humpback whales in the Dominican Republic, um, waters of the Dominican Republic for about 20 years. And it's, it's um, a similar but different program than in Tonga. Um, it's very well regulated and it's open ocean. So um, there's, a, there's a, a bank, you know, which is fairly shallow water, 30 to 100 feet deep out in the open ocean, which means there's no islands nearby. Um, so the water is rougher um, than in near shore waters and um, the visibility sometimes is not that great. So we're not allowed to get in the water with competitive groups in the Dominican, in Dominican waters. In Tonga, you are allowed to do that. And there you're swimming, it's an archipelago of these beautiful green islands 
And so it's, it's interior waters and it's calmer and usually, but not always, the visibility is quite good. And it's competitive group is basically, um, as far as we understand, there's a female in it and then there's like two or more males. And in Tonga, they're very often seven, 10 whales, males, and they're all competing for the opportunity to escort this female. And since nobody has ever seen humpback whales mate, we don't know how that, how that interfaces with this whole process. But we're allowed to get in the water with the competitive groups. And I'd always wanted to know what was going on underwater because when you see them, there's a lot of surface activity and sometimes one male you know, lashes out at another or rides him, you know, lots of blowing and lots of posturing. And then they'll go beneath the surface and it's quiet and you have no idea what's going on. So I specifically went to Tonga to get that opportunity and what they do, because whales are really large and they move really fast, is, and there's no way that even the best swimmer can keep up with fast swimming whales, is we find a competitive group, the captain decides that this is appropriate, it's good, and then we're dropped in the water sort of in front of them when they're beneath the surface. So they're not at the surface at that point where it could be quite dangerous. They're beneath the surface and they're interacting with one another. And you have just a few moments to see and photograph what's going on and boom, then they're gone. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting, but it's also, um, you know, some of my photos have some bubbles in them that are not from the whales that are from the faster swimmers who are ahead of me, um, but it's, it's pretty exciting. I find once you put your eye in a viewfinder, you now have tunnel vision. You're not seeing what's around you anymore. Can you, how do you, and in the water, <laughs> like it's dark, there's all kinds of things going on there and all sorts of images, like action around you. How do you stay safe in a situation where you're kind of focused on getting a picture? It's called having good situational awareness. Um, it, it's, so in a situation like that with the competitive group, I mean, we always have a guide in the water. So that's, and, and even in the Silver Bank, we always have a guide in the water and it's their job to, 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 to keep us safe, you know, to, 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 to know that. And I've done this so long that I, I understand a lot of the behavior myself, but um, there, there's a process of, you know, moving the camera up and looking over the top and then looking back in again. And if you see something that's coming towards you, you know, then figuring out what to do. And um, whales, humpback whales um, are, are not aggressive generally. I mean, they don't go out of their way to um, hurt people and they generally don't go out of the way to touch us. Um, I mean, I just saw a video yesterday of a I forget where it was taken, maybe in Australia, of a, a very curious humpback whale that was spy hopping where it brings its head out of the water and it inadvertently bumped the, the boat and cracked the, win the window on it, which happened to be safety glass. But that's very rare for them to actually touch, touch the boats. They come up and they've got a very good spatial sense. In fact, except in the competitive groups or the mothers and the calves, they don't usually touch each other. They're they're, they're in close, they may be in close proximity, but they're not like dolphins who may wrap their flippers together and you know, really, really engage in physical contact. So um, to me, in terms of quote unquote danger with humpback whales is the calves, because the calves are still learning. They're learning how to use their bodies and they're learning um, and they're a little clumsy and, um, and they can be a little naughty. So I've been bumped in the, in the legs by a calf that came through and just kind of swished its flute. And I remember one time when that happened and I asked our guide what I had done wrong and he said, you didn't get out of the way. <laughs> okay, um, which, which is the case, you know, initially we're told don't move because the whales know where you are. But with these calves, sometimes they know exactly where you are. They, they don't usually try and bump you, but they try and just kind of you know, might switch their flukes as a way of going in and in. And, um, I did have one 
really interesting encounter with a calf. And this was actually a number of years ago where um, our guide was up ahead closer to the, the mother and the calf. And the rest of us were in a line, um, maybe 15 feet behind him, maybe, I don't know, I lose track. I can't tell the distance, but far enough back. And the next thing without, I didn't see how it happened, but this calf is coming from behind and underneath me. And it is, I'm looking through my camera and I see this face and this eye staring straight at me and this peck fin is just missing my head. And then I just keep shooting and there's the ventral pleats, there's the belly. And then the calf taps my camera with his fluke. And I'm going, okay, that was interesting. <laughs> and then I thought, well, yeah, that was interesting, but I'm gonna go move to the other end of the line. I don't know what I thought that would do, but I didn't fool the calf. I get down there, I'm now at the opposite end of the line. This calf comes through, does the same thing really quickly and picks my camera up out of the water with its fluke and then sets it back down again. So it was like, it had, it had tested this, this odd thing and they, they seemed to be interested because the camera's got a big dome port. It's like a, um, a glass or plexiglass, like a mirror. So they can even see their reflection in it. I don't know what it's like to them, whether they, it's a giant eye or whether they just go, what is that strange appendage? And the first time it's like tested it. And the second time it went, oh yeah, I know how heavy it is. We can just do this. So that's a rare experience, but it was, um, it was pretty funny. Wow, so a playful whale that yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of, dangerous and fun. <laughs> now, I think this is interesting that you've told that the whales seem to know you, tracked you back. Oh, there, there she is. <laughs> She's got something I like. Um, what whales, um, that whale knows you, but you know other whales. Can you talk about uh, working to uh, help to identify the whales with the Allied Whale Project? Yes. So when I first started, um, well, before I actually swam out of the, the Silver Bank, I had um, gone to um, I'd gone to Maui and done an Earthwatch project with a researcher there named Adam Pack. And this was back in the film days and they were taking fluke ID photos and then putting them in you know, a binder um, with foot pages in it. And every time you got a new fluke photo, you would go through this binder and look to see if you could find a match because that's a very non-invasive way of gathering information on who these whales are, what they do, where they are at different times. And I was really intrigued with that. I just, I mean, I, there's something about knowing an animal personally that's very different than it just being a generic whale. So um, when I got out to the Silver Bank, and now thankfully we had digital, digital cameras, um, I wanted to know, you know, if anybody was gathering fluke ID photos. And it turned out there wasn't really much going on. And uh, a, a woman came over one day and introduced herself. She actually introduced herself to the person who was in um, leading the trips that I was going on and asked him if he was interested in sharing fluke photos. And he said, oh, go talk to Jody." So she connected me with the folks at Allied Whale. And at that point I started doing it seriously, taking my fluke photos, gathering from the crew on my boat, gathering from you know captain on another boat, um, anybody who was willing to give me their photos and sending them to, uh, to Allied Whale who would put them in their catalog. And in the meantime, I had made a, um, a, good, a journey to the East Coast because these whales are part of the North Atlantic population. And some of them feed um, the Stellwagen Bank off the coast of Massachusetts, um, Provincetown and Gloucester, Massachusetts. Some of them feed off of Maine. Some of them feed in Iceland, Norway. And I, I went and I met people in in Provincetown and Gloucester and Bar Harbor, Maine, and made the connections with them. And then I would send them some of my fluke photos because some of them know the whales in their head that visit because these whales have, it's called site fidelity. They come back to the same feeding area each season. 
And, um, and it became very exciting. And we started to learn things that might not have been known otherwise. For instance, we know that humpback whales, and most of this is from the, the feeding grounds, calf every two to three years. But what we don't know is how many calves are born down on the breeding calving grounds on the tropical waters, and the calves don't make it alive up to the... So if we see a female with a calf on the calving grounds, and then we see her with a calf the next year, and we share that information, it turns out the first calf didn't make it all the way. It died somewhere along the way. The second calf got there. Now they know that this whale had calves two years in a row, but that information would have would have gone unnoticed before. Interesting. So yeah. have you have you found other things? Have you been able to document other things with your camera that were previously unknown to scientists? Yes, but if I may, before I get to that question. Sure. Um, I, I've taken, you know, uh, because I think it's, it's very connected to Santa Cruz, is that um, a, a friend and colleague, Ted Cheeseman, has developed a um, software that is able to identify, do, do a really good job of matching flukes. And so he's developed a citizen science project called Happy Whale. And um, when I'm in Monterey Bay, when I'm in Antarctica, when I'm in Norway, anywhere in the world, I will submit my fluke photos to Happy Whale. And then, you know, we get instant feedback. This is whale so-and-so. And then you can go on the website and you can see where else this whale has been sighted and how many times it's been, it's been sighted. Um, and so that's, that, that's very rewarding. And I, I'm sure that Ted is coming up with all kinds of interesting information. Some of it has to do with matches where you don't expect the whale to go to a different calving ground than the rest of the whales in that population. As far as my own um, sort of discoveries, and, and this is maybe minor in terms of the, the fluke information, but I believe it was about two, maybe three years ago, 2018, I guess, uh, in Monterey, in Monterey Bay, we um, had two humpback whales that did something that had never been observed before. The day before, killer whales had, had taken a gray whale calf and um, boats had gotten there. They didn't see the kill, but they were there while the feeding was going on. And I went, uh, I wasn't there. I went out the next day and we went to the same location to see if the whales were still feeding because it can take several days. And lo and behold, there were a couple of killer whales and, um, and, then they, and, and then they left. Oh, and the carcass was there. And then the killer whales took off and our captain um, took off to follow them. And the captain on our other boat said, radioed her and said, you know, there are two humpbacks here with this carcass. So Nancy Black, who's our captain, turned around and went back. And for the next 12 minutes, we watched these two humpback whales in investigating this carcass. They would spy hop, they would come up backwards, they would reach out with their peck fins, they would kind of move their flukes towards it. Um, they appeared to be touching it with their sides, touching it with their heads. I mean, it was quite, it was quite amazing. And um, I ended up doing a scientific paper with, um, with Nancy Black as a co-author and Fred Sharp, who has, um, did all the seminal work on the bubble net feeding whales up in Alaska. And in the process of doing that, we discovered that, well, I, that, that one of the two whales had been there the day before when the killer whales were feeding. So it watched that going on. And oftentimes what the humpbacks will do is they'll, they'll interfere you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get aggressive towards the killer whales as if they don't want them to do that. So then came back the next day and brought a friend and they, um, they checked out this carcass. And then we were able to, to learn that both of these whales have been seen in breeding grounds in Mexico, that they're probably male. They've never been seen with calves. They've been seen like, you know, 60, 90 times a piece. So, you know, we got, we got a whole picture of who these whales are who are actually investigating that carcass. Interesting. I think elephants do that too with their, when they, an elephant dies, they 
they hang around and check it out. They do. And the biggest difference here is that one, we don't often see humpbacks with a dead calf of their own, but this was of a different species. And that was the part that has never been seen before on the wild. Interesting. So you mentioned Antarctica. <laughs> that cannot be an easy place to shoot. I saw your pictures of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> that looks really difficult. What is it like to shoot in such a hostile, I mean, it's one underwater, it's kind of hostile, but Antarctica, <laughs> that's really extreme. How do you, doesn't your cam, what do you have to do to keep your camera from freezing? Unfortunately, Antarctica's not that cold anymore. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, um, it's too bad. Actually, the first thing is you don't go in the, in the middle of winter. Okay, that's when researchers are down there. But, um, and when I have been there, it's been their fall. Um, and the weather's a little bit warmer, but you dress very warmly. You charge your batteries and, you know, you keep your spare batteries inside your clothes so that they're warm. And, um, you know, you've got good gloves, hard to photograph with, with the right kind of gloves on, so you may get cold fingers. And, um, you know, as, as with all of these, the, I said, not all, but a lot of the things that I do, I'm, I'm not just going on my own, in part because it's very expensive to get to Antarctica on your own. And um, it's really nice to have somebody else do the preparation. And you're out there on a very large ship that's nice and warm and cozy inside, and then you get zodiacs, and you're dressed properly for it, and you go out and you stay out for you know several hours at a time. You get a chance to uh, make landings, you know, walk around, see what's going on, and um, you know some the weather. I, I've been several times. Sometimes it's foggy, sometimes it's snowing, sometimes um, it's windy, sometimes it's sunny and warm. So you just kind of get used to dealing with the elements. Well, you went more than once, so it must not be that bad. <laughs> I, I never thought I would go more than once, but it's like the whales. It's a little bit addictive. Is there anywhere you have, haven't been that you would like to go to take photographs? This year, I was supposed to go to Svalbard in Norway. It's a separate island. Um, last, God, was it just last year? I was able to go to Franz Josef Land, which is as far north as I've ever been. That's a, a Russian archi archipelago. Um, and that was, um, that was really fascinating. I'm really glad I went. Um, but there wasn't quite as much wildlife. There were a lot of birds. We didn't see, we saw whales as we were coming back going through the Barents Sea. And we did see polar bears. Um, but I would like to go to Svalbard. And there are bears, polar bears there and um, Arctic foxes. And even the, the, the wildflowers, the Arctic wildflowers are just incredibly beautiful. And, you know, at this point, um, it's difficult to get photographs that haven't been taken before. And I've just been really, really drawn to parts of the world that are not as, as heavily visited. And unfortunately, COVID interrupted that trip. And we'll see if we can go next year. Is there a picture you haven't taken that you want to take? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do I know what it is? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I am seeing a lot of photographs these days that other photographers are taking that are quite extraordinary. And it's, it's like the bar keeps being raised. Um, there's a lot of drone images that are, are are extraordinary, they're winning in competitions. Uh, there are some that take probably more patience than I have, you know, of uh, birds doing extraordinary things. So um, it's, it's one of the things I like about whales because they're, they're there and um, they're large, it's easy to, easy to follow them. Um, and, and there are only so many things they do, but it's, it's also why being able to work on research projects with them is a great um, you know, it's a, a great compliment because I can, I, I can make my photographs actually work to help the species. Um, they can, they can help teach people and get people engaged and, and enthusiastic about protecting them. So 
what is see. the what is the message you hope you share in your photo in your photos? What do you hope people learn from you? I hope that my love of of this planet and the other species who inhabit this planet with us comes through in my images. Um, you know, the animals, I, I wanna say they can't speak for themselves or if they do, we can't understand them. And I hope that with my images and I try and, I try and educate people. So it's not just, oh, here's a whale breaching, but it's like, oh, this is, this is Angel Wing and this is her calf halo. And they came over to visit our boat today. And, you know, uh, halo breached a number of times and we see that same behavior in the silver bank where um, we call it taking the calf for a walk in the afternoon, you know, and being able to share that information and that this calf is, is probably, you know, on the, on the calving grounds, it hasn't migrated yet. So it has to be fit to make this very long thousand miles, thousands of miles swim, but it still needs to be fit. And it's, it's just a baby. So, um, you know, I, I hope to, I hope to, give people a window into the lives of these animals so that they will they will care as well and if without you know we don't care about them we can't do much to protect them which we definitely need to do thank you jody Frediani, for sharing your photos with us and your thoughts and all your work to conserve our beautiful planet thank you so much for having me it's been my pleasure you're so welcome. If you viewers would like to see more of Jody's wonderful photos, visit jodyfrediani.com. Thanks for watching. Joining me now. Good night.